Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this RedGamingTech.com video, we're going to be discussing, as well as analysing, tech news, which, as usual, has popped up in the past 24 or so hours. Hopefully, you're having an amazing day. We have a ton of stuff to get through in today's video. I want to start things out, though, with several stories concerning AMD, the first of which is actually very good news for AMD's financials. If you haven't uh, been following AMD's progress for the last several years, you may be surprised to realise that while AMD are very much the tech darlings now, for a while it did look like they were going to just disappear. They were drowning in debt, they had basically no presence in the server market. The FX line of processors for gaming, it did have fans, but Intel were just outperforming them, especially in game performance. Uh, their GPUs were okay, but NVIDIA's architectures were generally ahead, and so on and so on. And so it was looking very sketchy for a while uh, over at Team Red. But things are definitely very different now. And they are becoming a force in many divisions. Obviously, in graphics, they're about to release RDNA 2, which I've already had a couple of exclusives on. I'm actually getting ready to release more information on RDNA 2. It won't be in this video. It'll be in a different one. The CPUs, which we'll be discussing more in just a moment, are just absolutely selling like crazy. Data center, they're doing better. Still not perhaps where they should be, given the performance of their products. And, you know, I won't go through the litany of their uh, successes. But there is something very good about this, and that is that their debt is starting to be paid off. And this obviously means that they're lower risk in terms of uh, investment. So Bob Marston actually DM'd me about this, and as he puts it, there's a story which basically is flown under the radar. I'm going to uh, read this verbatim, as his tweet does a fairly good way of saying it rather succinctly. Um, brevity is not one of my strong suits. Last week, Moody's investment agency raised AMD's credit rating three notches to BAA3. This rating raises AMD's rating to investment grade. Under its own old rating, AMD was classified as a risk, a low risk, to default on its debt. AMD's debt to liquidity equity ratio went positive from the second half of 2019, and from guidance, Davinder Kumar. Uh, AMD's CFO gave us in the last conference call, AMD still made a sizable addition to its equity total, even with a large payout close on debt to its balance sheets. I won't go super into this because the financials of companies is not something we delve super into in the channel, but I do believe that this is definitely something that is worth noting just from the perspective of extra stability within the company. And from financials to something perhaps many of you will find more interesting, and that is a selection of information for the next generation of Ryzen processors. Now, before we get into a series of um, spec sheets, there is something I'd also like to tackle. I'm hearing a lot of evidence right now that the Ryzen 4000 series... Um, yeah, I'm hearing it may just be called the Ryzen 5000 series. I cannot confirm this as of the time I'm recording this video, but I am seeing a lot of evidence, and a couple of people are DMing me saying that it seems like AMD are not going to be calling the next generation desktop processors the 4000 series. So, for example, we won't see the 4700X. Instead, they will be the 5000 series. And why is this? Well, allegedly, it's to essentially have parity between the desktop marketing and the mobile marketing, which is definitely something that AMD have they've received criticism for. I think it's quite confusing. Maybe not uh, people necessarily who watch this channel or people super into tech, but I think the average person yeah, I think it can be a little weird to have these different names. Personally, I like the idea of the uniformity. I don't feel it's necessary, but I think it makes sense from a marketing perspective. So essentially, Zen 3-powered devices, whether it's desktop 
or mobile will be, you know, Ryzen 5000. That's what I'm hearing. This could be incorrect, of course, but I believe it's true. There have been rumours swirling on the internet for a while about that, but now one of my more trusted sources has told me that that's what they're hearing, and then someone else also told me the same thing, so... I'm going to probably say that there's a good possibility it's true. But now I want to move over to a selection of data sheets that I've been provided. And actually, it's one data sheet with tons of uh, information. That's a better way of describing it. Now, I actually had page 48 of this. And don't worry, we're not going to be going through all of this. Um, but I wasn't given permission to share it, unfortunately. Um I have some other stuff that I'm just not allowed to share yet, unfortunately, too. But I've now received this sheet again from someone else. CyberpunkCat on Twitter uh, sent me this in an email after contacting me yesterday. Um, and again, I, obviously I cannot verify that this information is correct. But the fact that I've received at least one of these sheets from two people now... And, yeah, I, I think it's pretty, I think it's fairly likely it's accurate. With that said, let's delve into this. So there are a number of things here which are confirmed. The first is that the core complex die, CCD, is now essentially one CCX. So these are now up to eight cores, which can run in either single or SMT mode. I find that interesting, the fact that they denote that, for a total of 16 threads per complex. There's 512 kilobytes of level 2 cache per core, and this means that there's 4 megabytes of L2 cache per CCD. This is identical to the older Zen, so Zen 2 for example. We now have 32 megabytes of level 3 cache, which is shared across all of the cores within the complex. Again, while 32 megabytes was in Zen 2, obviously you had that split between the two CCXs, which were in one core, but then AMD basically accidentally, I'm sure it was deliberate to be honest with you, leaked the um, diagrams showing how Zen 3 differed from Zen 2, and obviously we saw that the caches as well as the cores were unified. So again, this is not super new information. It just reinforces what we already knew. But I think it's nice, you know, just to kind of be aware of this. Scalability data fabric. This provides the data path to connect to compute, uh, compute complexes, the I.O. interface and the memory. They handle various requests. Um, handles probe traffic to facilitate coherency, supporting 512 uh, gigabytes per DRAM channel, handle interrupt uh, request routing, APIC. Uh, again, I'm not going to read out all of this because there is so much here and it's on screen anyway. Memory. Two unified memory controllers, UMC, each supporting one DRAM channel. Two DDR4 PHYs. Each PHY supports 64-bit data plus ECC. One DRAM channel per PHY, so exactly how we expect. Two DIMMs per channel, so memory configuration is similar there to the older Zen, but we also have information as to the transfer rates too. They support from 1333 up to 3200 MTS. So, obviously, this doesn't mean that it's the maximum speed that you can run. I would actually be interested to see how fast the memory scales with the next generation Ryzen, but officially it seems that it's 3200 megahertz that's supported. Again, there is tons of other information here too, like NBIO. We could see, for example, that there are two um, 8 times 16 PCIe controllers supporting Gen 1, 2, 3, 4. SATA support, however, is two PCIe ports and two SATA ports on the same two lanes, 24 lanes total, uh, combo PHY and UPI uh, muxing. Again, there's also the Southbridge information and FCH if you prefer, and it mentions things like high-definition audio, up to two lanes of SATA Gen 1, Gen 2, Gen 3, and provides legacy SATA support for SATA E ports shared with PCIe, USB 3.1 Gen 2, Four ports, including legacy USB speeds, so obviously you can use like older USB devices and so on and so on. 
I will also include some other bits as well. Um, but it's really the 1.91 AM4 desktop, which is quite interesting. We could see that for module type, single or multi-die, uh, micro, pin, grid, array, common socket, infrastructure with AM, other AM4 platforms, memory, channel, uh, module, there's two, max dims per channel is two. Again, they are clarifying that it's 1.2 volts up to 3200 megahertz. That's what they recommend. And we also, again, have mention of the PCIe configuration too. So this information, honestly, um, there are a couple of interesting things here. The most uh, surprising thing is that we finally have confirmation as to the clock frequencies of Zen 3. So that it does seem to be 3200 megahertz. But um, unfortunately, we are still left with a ton of questions for the next generation of Ryzen. And moving from AMD, and now we're going to move over to NVIDIA and the RTX 3080 because we have some overclocking information. This primarily revolves around the memory and it seems that 20 Gbps is actually quite easy to hit. Um, full credit to videocards.com for this one. There are two GPUs which are being tested. There's a Founders Edition versus an AIB reference model. We don't know what the reference board was, at least... Um, what I can see, they've said that uh, Asus is not seeding Rock Strix to reviewers, but the Tough Gaming instead. Gigabyte is not ready, and these are all custom uh, designs with higher TDP. It seems that the best choice so far is the Founders Edition, as it has a TT TDP excuse me, of 370 watts. And you can see that the actual... Um, the actual AIB reference board is limited to just 350, so obviously that's not quite as high. And there's also a larger adjustment range for the Founders Edition Model 2. As for overclocking results, it's not huge. Um, we're looking at about 2, maybe 3% increase in performance. That seems to be overclocking both the GPU as well as the memory. So obviously 2 or 3% is not bad. But it also is not going to drastically change performance. It's not, at the end of the day, going to change your gaming experience drastically. But, for example, times by um, 16703 goes up to 17277. Um, so that's the larger increase. Whereas Fire Strike Ultra 1183 and then 11319. So that's a 2% increase. So this does seem to indicate that memory-wise, at the least, you can crank the memory clock frequencies much higher. Um, there have been some uh, tests which show that the memory can go up to 20.7, which is interesting because there were quite a few leaks that NVIDIA were planning to hit 20.5 or at least 20 Gbps, but obviously they didn't. So it's nice, but um, in the end of the day, it... Uh, at this point, I just want to see the GPUs launch and also to see what AMD do to, uh, to counter. I also would like to discuss briefly the PS5 spec rumours. Essentially, there are rumours that the PS5 specs were updated, I guess, last minute for mass production units. So we have 38 CU and 512 gigabytes per second compared to 36 and 448 respectively. The thing is, I am 99.9% .9 certain that this is rubbish. The only reason I'm covering it is because I've already gotten tagged in this on social media, already received an email, had a couple of DMs already, so I just wanted to put my uh, couple of cents out there and then kind of hopefully we can never talk about this again as I'm... Uh, I, it's just no way it's going to be true. For one reason, they mentioned that there's 38 uh, compute units, which, okay... That has some questions, but we'll get to those in a second. However, it's only in stressful situations and stays at 36 actively. That doesn't make any sense. There's no way that if the GPU is suddenly becoming more busy, they would turn on more CU. Like, it's just it, it just wouldn't make any sense. Variable frequency is fine. They would not, however, disable 2CU in general. Um, and that's if even you can have 38 compute units. So I believe I mentioned in a video that uh, will the PS5 and Xbox get an upgrade or something like that, that 
maybe we could see 38 CU in theory for PS5 if the yields were as good as I was hearing, but I was rather sceptical about this because I don't know if it would work for the RDNA2 architecture simply because how RDNA2 works, I don't know if they can do that or not. Um, long story short then, I'm sceptical of it for those two reasons alone. The 512 gigabytes per second, I think that also might be based upon something I've said. But again, um, I believe this was kind of an older video of mine. One of the things I've been hearing was that the PS5 had um, sparked debates internally in Sony. Basically, Sony Japan and US, I believe it was the US that wanted higher bandwidth. I could be wrong on that. Um... And there were internal debates, so I mentioned in a video that maybe the final production units would be 512 gigabytes per second bandwidth. However, I was kind of sceptical about this because it would have increased the cost of the system. Obviously, faster DRAM increases the cost, and given the PS5 was rumoured to be so expensive with its BOM anyway, bill of materials, I didn't really think Sony would do this, especially given everything we're hearing so far, including what I'm hearing for the grapevine, the PS5 doesn't seem to be particularly bottlenecked by memory bandwidth. It seems to be okay. So, yes, memory bandwidth is always a good thing. However, I don't think that they would want to increase the cost of production and go with this for faster bandwidth. With that said, it's still possible that they might, but I'm very sceptical at this point anyway. So, 38 compute units, active, variable, it's just it, it's just not feasible. Um, the last thing also is that if we do see updated specs for the PS5 or the Xbox, it's possible that we don't even know that they are updated. Because while things like clock frequencies and the amount of RAM, for example, that's easy to spot. However, something that's subtler, like, for example, memory timings we wouldn't know that they'd been updated, but memory timings can be just as critical, can be just as crucial as the actual throughput of bandwidth, because it can actually scale better, for example, with CPU-related uh, tasks. So, again, I'm not saying they have tightened the memory timings, I'm simply pointing out that if they have tightened the memory timings, we wouldn't know that, even though it's something that's quite critical to the system, they could have for example, also uh, improve something to do with the caches of the CPU or a dozen other things that ultimately wouldn't necessarily show up on the system specifications that have been publicly released. But the reality is it would still have a tangible benefit to developers. So I would say at this point, I'm still not hearing anything specific about console updates for the final mass production units. Microsoft have gone on record at this point and stated that the Series X is still 1825. I had thought maybe they would increase the GPU clock. That hasn't happened. Sony have said crap all about their system for quite a long time now. So I would probably go ahead and say that there's no update to the hardware. Even if there is, I'm very, ske I'm very skeptical that this particular individual had any uh, inside information i'm pretty damn sure that the 38 active variable is just yeah anyway anyway i think that's just about it for this particular video hopefully you've enjoyed it the normal stuff like share comment and subscribe and i'll see you soon take care of yourselves bye for now